Hi, and welcome to Monitoring a Changing Arctic, Half a Century of Change at the Top of the World. We are so pleased that you are joining Friends of Cooper Island for our annual update. Our long-term study of Arctic seabirds, spanning nearly a half century and led by Dr. George Devoki, has continued to provide compelling evidence of the biological effects of global warming and its impacts on the Arctic. I'm Dr. Katie Morrison, a science educator here in Seattle and the board chair for the nonprofit group Friends of Cooper Island that supports Cooper Island Arctic research. While 2020 had our attention focused on other concerns, global warming still continued. 2021 promises to be a year when the issue of climate change is taken seriously by both the government and the general public. This makes our continuing research, our education and outreach programs all the more important. We were incredibly fortunate to be able to conduct our field season in Arctic Alaska this past summer. Tonight, George will describe what he calls the impossible field season of 2020 and also summarize his past 46 years on a remote Arctic island and what they tell us about the melting Arctic. While we typically enjoy seeing our friends and supporters in person in Seattle for this event, we are happy so many of you from near and far are able to join us for this virtual format. We also want to give many thanks to our donors who have made our research, outreach, and this virtual event possible. I'd now like to introduce Dr. George Devoki. Thanks much, Katie. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to Friends of Cooper Island's first and hopefully last virtual only event. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we have an annual Seattle update, which is usually a time for sharing um, uh, food and beverage and socializing with our supporters in Seattle and talking about what happened dur during the last field season. It is a big part of my year because I spend four to six weeks alone on a regular basis out on an island and being in a room with various supporters uh, really helps a lot. Um, I'm speaking to an empty auditorium today, uh, but I'm doing that because I think that it is important for you to be thinking about climate change and be and, and, and be updated on things that we have found out since our, since our last uh, annual update, which was two years ago, because we had to cancel our 2021 because of, uh, because of 2020. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Town Hall for making the accommodations for having this virtual event, um, and for our board and our donors for, 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 for making it possible. I have spent uh, half a century in the Arctic. And um, I have seen a number of things which some of you may know about, uh, others that, uh, that you may not know about. And I understand that there are people, because of the fact that this is online, who might have never heard one of our updates. So I will be going over some things that I have talked about in the past and then talk about the more recent findings uh, because there have been a number of rather exciting things uh, in terms of our data analysis that have come out in the past uh, two to three years. And um, there will be time for questions uh, at the end of this talk. And if you want to post them uh, online uh, in, into, the, into the chat room, um, uh, Katie will be, will be taking them and passing them on. So, uh, and you can certainly obviously uh, uh, post questions uh, during, the, during the question and answer period. So now I'd like to start the slide presentation. Um, I got to the Arctic in the early 1970s because of, uh, because of the Prudhoe Bay oil discovery uh, in, in, the, uh, in the near shore of Beaufort Sea. And uh, I was uh, part of a group that was doing a study of what was offshore of Prudhoe Bay to see what would happen if, um, if supertankers were, in, were coming into the Beaufort Sea. The concept of supertankers coming into the Beaufort Sea uh, only occurred because of the fact that the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which was going to be built from Prudhoe Bay to Prince William Sound, was being held up in the courts for uh, reasons of environmental assessment. So from 1970 to 1972, I did surveys of the offshore birds and the onshore birds in the, in the, in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. Um, luckily, uh, prior to... Uh, any super tankers visiting the Arctic Ocean, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline was built. Um, what they had planned was to take things through the Northwest Passage, which um, in retrospect seems amazing given the fact that many 
uh, much smaller boats can't even get through now, and that they were thinking about this uh, almost 50 years ago um, was 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 clearly a clearly a pipe dream, if you will. Um, and there was one vessel that came through, the Manhattan. Uh, it got to Prudhoe Bay, got one 55-gallon drum of oil, and then uh, took it back to the East Coast, and they realized you couldn't really move oil from Prudhoe Bay to the East Coast uh, by supertanker, and certainly not in 55-gallon increments. So as part of my uh, survey of the, of the islands uh, in the Chukchi in the Beaufort Seas, I visited Cooper Island. Uh, and the Inupiat uh, name for Cooper Island is uh, Igloroc. And uh, Cooper Island is a low sand and gravel bar. It's around uh, three miles long. It's not higher than six feet, uh, roughly two meters above, above, above sea level. And it is 30 uh, miles east of Point Barrow, Alaska, and most importantly, uh, around th 35 miles east of Utkiavik, uh, uh, formerly Barrow, Alaska, the largest Inuit community uh, in, uh, in, the, in the United States. Cooper Island um, has driftwood lines like this on, on it, as, as do most of the barrier islands. And I was doing a survey that summer and basically counting the number of birds that were breeding in these drift, driftwood lines, which typically offers the only uh, suitable habitat for breeding birds. Uh, you would see things like uh, Sabine's gulls, Arctic terns, common eiders, things like that long-tailed ducks. And when I got to Cooper uh, in, uh, in early July 72, I was surprised to find a bunch of boxes and blown up buildings and floorboards and various things like that, um, which, which no one had told me about. And, and, and I had spent some time in Barrow at that point, and no one had mentioned, oh, by the way, there's this site on Cooper uh, that, the, that, that, the, that the Navy left. But the Navy had left these things in the 1950s. And um, I, was, I, w I was very excited to find black guillemots, um, a, a, uh, a diving seabird in the same family as puffins, breeding in one of the boxes that um, had been left there by the, uh, by the, by the Navy. And actually, there were, there, there were 10 nests that I found in 1972. I was very interested in the family Alcidae, which black guillemots are part of. And I was, I was very intrigued by this. It was, the first, it was a range extension. It was the first record of them breeding in, in the Alaska Beaufort Sea. So I turned over some pieces of wood uh, and went back later on in July and found that birds were breeding in some of the sites I had created. And th this, this for me was a, was a major uh, breakthrough in that I, uh, in that I realized uh, that I could create nest sites for what to me at that point and still is a rather exotic, interesting seabird. And doing that at the edge of the Arctic Ocean was, 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 was a major accomplishment. So uh, just to give you some background on the black guillemots, um, it is a, it is a uh, diving seabird uh, that, unlike most seabirds, has two eggs, which means that it feeds very close to its breeding colony. Uh, Seabirds typically lay one egg because they may go, you know, hundreds of miles away to find food to feed their young. Guillemots feed on nearshore prey typically and are able to actually raise two young on a regular basis. They have young that hatch uh, after 28 days of incubation that, um, um, that then grow rapidly uh, because the parents are feeding them for the next 35 days. They have a five-week nestling period. Uh, so that nestlings fledge rather close to adult weight at 350 grams. So there is a tenfold increase uh, in mass uh, over, over that nestling period, which means that the parents have to have lots of food close by. So I, I happened to, in, uh, in the, uh, the mid-70s, uh, have some funds from the government because they were thinking about uh, drilling offshore because of the Arab oil embargo. And I, uh, I was able to, to, to go back to Cooper, and I was able to build nest sites. Uh, I basically just turned over various pieces of wood that were there and, and built them and found that the guillemots would basically occupy them uh, almost as fast as I, could, as I could build them. And by the late 1980s, built the colony up to the largest black guillemot colony in the state of Alaska of, of over, over 200 pairs. Now, Having them be in artificial sites is an important thing because seabirds breed in places where predators, including humans, can't get to them. And typically, you will find them uh, on rocky shorelines. You'll find them in scree and talus slopes and things like that. And, um, and uh, 
this is great for the guillemots. It isn't great for the, bir for the people who are trying to study them. I had worked at some colonies on guillemots trying to reach down into these very deep cavities, and it was a very hard thing to do. Having easy access to nest sites, to having easy access to eggs, chicks, and even the adults, lets you do a seabird study that can be done in much more depth than one that is at a natural colony. And I should mention that when I first thought about working on seabirds, I would read all the British uh, publications and, and also very some nice, very nice uh, uh, narratives about what it's like to live on an isolated island off the British coast. And I always hoped that I could spend my days working at a colony like this, which is a which is a uh, uh, a uh, black guillemot colony off the off the coast of Great Britain. And I didn't realize that by building up uh, wooden nest sites on a flat barrier island, I would spend the next 47 years at a place that looks like a parking lot where someone has left a lot of wood and some pigeon-like birds are wandering around. It is not the most um, uh, scenic spot to be, but it is by far uh, one of the best places to study a seabird because you can study most everything you want about them because you can go up to a nest, pick it up, and then um, measure the egg, measure the chick, or catch the adult if you want to band it. And luckily, guillemots are very tolerant of, of people uh, holding them. And, um, and I, I can catch them on the nest or I catch them with noose mats. Um, I, can, I can band them and set them free, and they will frequently go right back to their nest site a after I've handled them so that I'm not disturbing the birds to any great extent. Um, what this has let me do is band um, most of the adults, 99% uh, of all the adults that have bred on the island since 1978, certainly, and all of the young that have fledged from the island since 1975. Uh, both of those give you the ability to analyze data by an individual basis. It gives you a chance to look at lineage because we know who's related to who. So it was a very unique situation, and I was, I was, I was very happy uh, to... Uh, to, to have found a place where I, could, where I could do this sort of seabird study. One thing I didn't know when I started the study is that uh, black guillemots are part of the, uh, of the cryopelagic or the pack ice ecosystem. There is, a, um, there is a, a, there's an algae bloom that takes place uh, in the ice and a phytoplankton bloom that takes place under the ice that provides the energy for, for, the, uh, for, this, for, this, for this system. An Arctic cod, are the primary species that is consumed by any upper trophic level marine predator in the Arctic because it really is the only fish to eat. And, 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 and uh, essentially, uh, seals and polar bears are just repackaged Arctic cod as are black guillemots. This, this makes the system very sensitive to the availability and the, and the condition of Arctic cod. And we didn't know, or I didn't know when I started, just how sensitive uh, there, that, that, that the guillemots were going to be to changes that might be taking place. One of the reasons that they are tied to the ice as much as they are is that during, during the last glacial maximum, when, when there was a Bering Land Bridge, there was an area of the Arctic Ocean that was not glaciated, but was covered with pack ice. And apparently, based on some research done by Queen's University, um, there, was a, uh, there were a group of guillemots that got trapped there and essentially lost all migratory inclination and also became totally dependent on sea ice. Um, this, was the, this was the range of the, of the black guillemot uh, during the, of Mance black guillemot, which is now uh, a subspecies, uh, during, dur, dur, during the last glacial maximum. As the last glacial maximum ended, um, and 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 the and the and the glaciers uh, started to melt and and open things up, you then had a situation where uh, birds could then b be in a much broader area. And what the current range is of Mance Black Guillemot is basically the area that the uh, that the ice extends into the Bering Sea, and also the area where the ice is present up in the up in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, but. But it is still a very much, uh, even though it has access to ice-free waters now, it is very much um, a, uh, an ice-adapted species. Um, I didn't know when I was starting, and there was no way of essentially most anyone knowing, that, uh, that climate change was going to take place and dominate my study um, and, and now dominate um, our, 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 our lives as much as it is. 
but um, for, the, for the 25 years before I started the study in 1975, there was no real global warming going on. Uh, certainly Cooper Island was at a place where uh, there was no sign that there was any sort of warming happening. Um, and that, that, that L-OTI is the Land Ocean uh, Temperature Index. Um, but since I started the study in 1975, this is what's happened to global temperatures. And again, we had no idea that when we started the study that we'd be studying an ice-adapted species uh, in a rapidly warming world and a species dependent on something that can, uh, uh, that can change with just a change in temperatures, such as when water, just when, just when ice turns to, turns, turns to water. Um, Utkiavik, Alaska has seen major regional warming o over the course of my study. Um, um, that has had a major uh, effect on both the snow cover and the ice cover. Um, the area offshore uh, of Utkiavik, uh, the ocean, has seen the ice go from being almost constant back in the 50s, that basically it wasn't disappearing in uh, September, to now not being present. And this is not just for, for northern Alaska, it's happening for the whole state. And I'd like to thank Rick Toman, uh, who, who, who generates these great graphs, uh, showing what is going on. Uh, and he does this on a regular basis on Twitter. If you're interested in all, I would, I would follow him uh, on, 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 on Twitter. But, but as you can see, northern Alaska has gone through a temperature change in the last 50 years, which is what the rest of the world is fearing in terms of a two centigrade uh, increase of six, Fahrenheit degrees are roughly equal like to roughly three, uh, three Celsius. So, so basically, northern Alaska has been through the change that the rest of the world is fearing. And what this has meant is that Cooper Island, that used to have the ice up against it um, uh, for certainly much of my study, now has the ice, and this is the 20, the 20, 19 minimum uh, compared to the uh, 81 2010 uh, minimum extent. You can see how an ice adapted species that was trying to breed at, at, the, at a location like Cooper Island is now in a place where its favorite habitat is no longer present. What this lack of ice has done was me has meant that there's more ocean, uh, open, uh, open ocean that is exposed to solar radiation. It then abs uh, absorbs uh, the solar radiation and becomes warmer. And there's also warming that's taking place because of warmer waters coming through the Bering Strait. But essentially, a, uh, there's been a major change that has occurred in terms of both ice cover and sea, for sea surface temperature in the, in, in the area that the Mance Black Guillemot uh, occupies. So some of my earlier findings, and these are just the things that, that seem to be very uh, kind of uh, almost you know, benign in retrospect, is that those increasing atmospheric temperatures meant that the snow was melting earlier. We didn't know the importance of snow melt to the species until we went out uh, in late May 84 and realized the birds didn't show up until the snow melted. And we, and we have since then done a number of uh, years where we can show that the birds show up when the snow melts. And as a result, they are getting to the island earlier, they're getting to their nest cavities earlier, and they are laying eggs earlier. And, um, and there has been a very regular trend of both, uh, uh, the, both, both, the, both the date of snow melt uh, and the first egg in the colony and the, and, and the median egg in the colony that has, that has uh, had them breeding earlier because of climate change. Um, we didn't know how important that opening up in the early part of the season was until August 88, when we realized that there was a, um, uh, that, that, that in certain years, uh, um, uh, it, it can snow and build up around the nest sites. Up until recently, it, it, it would snow any day of the summer uh, in Utkiavik or on Cooper Island. I, I've seen snow essentially every day from the 1st of June to the 1st of September. And uh, usually it would melt right away. But in August 88, uh, it was a very, there, was, there, there was a cold snap, there was a lot of snow, there was a lot of wind, so you got drifts. And uh, snow would build up in front of nest sites, so parent birds who were trying to feed their young in these, in these wooden nest sites um, had... Uh, had had no way of, fee of, 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 of feeding their young. And we realized that, okay, so birds can't breed successfully if you have a snow-free window that is less than the 80 days that it takes for them to go from the female ovulating when the, when the cavity is free of snow to the chick leaving um, 80 days later. And looking at the 80-day window, 
it's 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 clear that 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 80 day uh, that the that the that the breeding period that the summer window the snow free window has opened up greatly and that in the recent past it was very close to 80 days so this was a good thing i mean in theory for 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 guillemots because they were then able to uh, to to lay earlier uh, young young birds that might be breeding for the first time wouldn't have to be there just at the first snow melt to to be able to be successful. So this was actually a somewhat positive, if you will, thing for the guillemots because it let them breed more successfully and also earlier and, and just have more time to fledge chicks. Um, so the other thing we saw uh, rather early on, um, and early on means we saw it in 2003, um, is that there was a change of prey with the sea ice loss, as things were warming to melt the snow earlier, sea ice was also uh, melting more and pulling offshore. And guillemots uh, are, uh, are birds that come back feed, uh, to, to, to feed their young by carrying one prey item in their bill, which is very handy because then you can see exactly what prey species uh, that, they, that, 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 that they are bringing back. Um, certain seabirds will basically eat a bunch of food offshore and then regurgitate to the, to their, to their young, making it hard to see what they're feeding on. Guillemots um, are able to bring back one, but though it also limits them because they are then having to bring back just one prey item each time. And what we found uh, is that from 1975 through 2003, that Arctic cod, this, this like under ice uh, forage fish that, that is very abundant uh, under 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 sea ice uh, was essentially the only prey being 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 brought back, and uh, parent birds were doing very well with it um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, being able to find enough food to to like raise their raise their young, but then in 2003 um, the I, oh, we had the ice pull off rather quickly and a warming temperature take place. And we saw just in one year, and it was very striking, uh, that birds were coming back with sculpin, with four-horned sculpin, which is a species that, that the parents don't like uh, uh, because they're hard to carry. The chicks don't like them because they have this large, uh, this large uh, uh, head, spiny head, that, that is hard to swallow. Once it gets to the stomach, it takes a while for it to break down so they can't feed as often as they'd like. And this was a major shift, and we saw this having a major impact on the on the uh, on the quality of the of the chicks in terms of their growth rate and their survival. Chicks, uh, just to show you a picture of what can happen, chicks don't like them to the point where they will be close to uh, they will certainly be food deprived, and they will be rejecting. This is a shot down into a nest site um, with 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 various uh, sculpin that chicks have, uh, have the chicks have rejected. Um, there is, a, there is a paper out that had some early results of this showing how the first uh, years of the study when the, when the temperature, when the sea surface temperature was close to the temperature that, uh, that, that, that Arctic cod-like um, had high breeding success with frequently two nestlings being, being raised that for the period that was analyzed in this paper from 2003 to 2012, the ice was much further offshore Birds were feeding their young sculpin, and you had a much higher rate of uh, of, of chick death. There's some there's some very recent work that uh, Kyle Elliott of McGill and his his uh, student Aaron Brown have I have have worked on, and this is coming out in a publication rather soon. We made observations on a daily basis of what prey was being brought back. And then we found out the temperature, uh, basically with these temperature depth recorders, which I'll talk about a bit later, of the water when those prey were being brought back. And you can see how at two degrees uh, uh, Celsius, uh, Arctic cod start to drop out. I mean, this is, this is still obviously <laughs> rather cold water and sculpin start to, start to come in so that, so that it's clear that there is less availability of cod which is the preferred prey once you get past two degrees Celsius, and then once you get higher than higher than 3.5 or so, it's basically all sculpin. So we were able to show how this how this change uh, in temperature is uh, is uh, impacting uh, prey choice. What this means to the guillemots is that they can't find enough to feed their young, and this was 2017, which was the warmest year we've had so far, but this. This, this basically shows what happens when parents can't find prey. 
chicks started dying within three to four days after hatching. And one of the things that happens in a two chick brood like this is that, is that, the, is that the older chick, the alpha chick, starts grabbing all the food that comes in. And, and the beta chick doesn't get any, so which is why you can see that the, that like the beta uh, deaths are all taking place just at the first part of the season, mainly because the alpha chick is getting all the food that comes into the nest site. Um, and then, the, then, then things were so bad that there was a period then when beta chicks were dying. And also the breeding success of uh, roughly 36% uh, well, or so is half of what you need to maintain a viable colony. So this was the impact that the loss of Arctic cod was having. Uh, on them. So there's been a changing seascape north of Cooper Island, and I've witnessed this uh, perfectly. And this is a, um, I mean, it is one of the things about this study, and one of the things that Friends of Cooper Island has been able to maintain is that we haven't hired uh, a, 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 a new person every five years or every year or so to go out and see what's going on and have real, and have no memory of what it was like in 1975, or what it was like in 1985 or 1995. And so, like, I mean, I have seen things go on Coop Round from this sort of seascape on the north side of the island to this sort of seascape now. And parent, parent guillemots that are feeding their young used to be able to go out and essentially find probably lots of Arctic cod in this situation, and also use the ice as a cue as to where the cold water was in, and, 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 and where the cod was. And now they go out to this, which is uh, a situation where they have to just probably just drop in the water and, tr and, 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 and try to find what they can. And on a, on a personal note, this change has also impacted me in that there is no fresh water on Cooper Island. We, for, oh, 30 years, drank multi-year ice that has most of the salt driven out of it, and we would wait for pieces of good multi-year ice to wash up on the North Shore. We'd melt it in garbage bags and then um, have that as our drinking water, um, and, and we really re didn't have to rely on, on like anything else. Now, we can't do that due to this uh, type of situation and also the fact that multi-year ice has essentially uh, disappeared from much of the Arctic. So, so, so like what has happened is that rather than having this Arctic cod, under ice, algae, phytoplankton bloom drive, uh, drive the seabird populations as they did in the past, now um, they are reliant on, um, on the epibenthos, which includes sculpin and various, uh, various other fish that might be there. And one of the big changes is that when you have something like Arctic cod, which can occupy the whole water column, from the certainly from the from the from the surface down to the bottom, there's a much larger volume of 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 water that that the fish can occupy, and also you you then as a result get much larger fish populations. If you are on the bottom, you basically have a a a, a, a flat surface that fish and other organisms might be on. So there is a smaller prey base. So, so there has been that change, uh, both in terms of the fact that sculpin are not that uh, palatable, but also the fact that there are probably a lot less of them than there are Arctic cod. So, so as I was watching uh, uh, birds starve to death in the nest sites and things like that because of the ice retreat, the ice retreat also was affecting two species that came to play a major role in how the colony fared in the 1990s and early 2000s. Horn puffins are common in the Bering Sea. Um, and there's, they're, they're like, they're, they're, there used to be well over a million of them in the Bering Sea. They colonized uh, in very small numbers, less than five pairs, uh, Cooper Island in, 19, in 1986, which was kind of exciting. But this was a subarctic species moving north in response to the fact that the ice was melting and the, and the ocean was getting warmer. It was a clear climate change uh, signal. What we didn't think about when they first showed up is that they're, they are a nest competitor with, with black guillemots. They go into guillemot nest cavities. They will push out eggs, uh, which I don't even have graphed here, but they will, they will then kill uh, guillemot nestlings uh, that are in, in, the, in, the, in the cavities. And as you can see, um, uh, in like certain years, they were a major f uh, factor in terms of the, of the uh, chick mortality. Um, as that was going on, about at the same time, just, just a few years later, we had not seen polar bears up until 2000, uh, um, 
three really uh, in any number. This one, this one happened to be out here in 2002. Actually, actually, it was in 2002 when they first showed up. Gary Brosh took this excellent photo of one of the first polar bears we saw up close on Cooper Island. And it was very, very exciting at the time. Again, we didn't think much about what this would mean to the, to the, to the Guillemot population. But then we realized that essentially polar bears are showing up on the island. They are hungry. They are looking for things to eat. And that, and that the same access that I liked so much about the nest sites on Cooper Island now meant that a large predator had the same access. They could just flip over the sites and eat the chicks. Um, this was, of course, uh, disturbing. Uh, I mean, if you weigh a chick for uh, four to five weeks or so, and then a polar bear comes and eats it, but then you also feel bad that the polar bear is stranded on the beach um, tr trying to find what it can to survive. So this was, as some people said, gee, that is an interesting climate change factor, but it was also messing up the study to a certain extent because we wanted to see how the birds were reacting to prey availability um, more than seeing how many chicks a polar bear could eat in a given year, which turns out to be a lot because we had certain years where they, they could almost devastate the colony. I mean, um, I was out there for much of the summer um, and certainly for the past 10 years I've been out there, um, or the past 20 years uh, th throughout the whole breeding period. My presence will keep polar bears away, but things would have been much worse uh, if I hadn't been out there. And also they would have essentially stopped all birds from breeding uh, successfully um, uh, and, and essentially have doomed the colony unless we did something. Um, and just to show you what puffins, what what two invasive species uh, did um, um, so far uh, in, the, in, in the study, that there's 611 nestlings that were killed uh, by puffins and polar bears total. So um, we, uh, we then thought, okay, maybe we can build a nest case that polar bears can't get to, uh, can't get in. And we, we, tried, uh, in, we tried in 2010, we tried 10 nest cases. The only successful breeding in 2010 took place in those, in those plastic nest cases. And in 2011, we took out 225 plastic nest cases and replaced all the wooden sites that gave me the, the easy access and gave the polar bears easy access um, so, that, so that these birds could breed there and not have their growth rates and other vital rates that we wanted to measure upset by the fact that they had been eaten by polar bears. One of the things this has done, and I, I mentioned uh, Cooper is not the most scenic place, but if you fly over, and a helicopter pilot mentioned this to me recently, if you fly over the colony now, it looks like a Samsonite luggage truck has exploded because there are 225 uh, of, these, of these black nest cases. But it turns out that that does stop polar bear predation. And, but having seen all that, um, we then, um, uh, we then th thought, okay, we have a good idea as to what's driving the population, that things, things started warming up in the Arctic, uh, polar bears started showing up, puffins started showing up, and the colony has dropped in its total population from over 200 uh, to, like, to, like, to like well over, uh, to, well, to, well, to like less than 100 uh, recently. And we thought we had a good fix uh, on that. Now, it turns out that, and this is, I mean, if, if, if you can find things like this exciting, uh, they are exciting if you've been looking at a colony like this for years and you have new insights in it. If the insights mean that, that other things are going on, then, then they're somewhat depressing. But um, I am somebody who is a, uh, a curious naturalist, if you will. I'm not a population modeler. I'm not a statistician. I would rather be out observing birds, uh, recording data on them, um, trying to intuit what is going on by, by, especially by spending 13 weeks out in the field rather than spending 13 weeks in front of a computer trying to run a computer model. And, um, and by the way, uh, that, that, that book I'm holding in this uh, is, the, is a field book from 1972 where I uh, first wrote down, gee, there are guillemots on Cooper Island. So, so I had, um, uh, and I still have, a, a very long-term data set. And I was, I've been very lucky uh, in the past five years or so to, to like meet people who are very good at analyzing data. Uh, I have my French collaborators uh, in Chizé, 
Uh, Christoph Barbrod is a um, is a Renaissance man when it comes to seabird studies. He does modeling. He does a wide range of work. And I had approached him and I said, could we possibly collaborate? I have this data set. And when he saw the data set, and I was very humbled by it. I mean, he said, he said, well, this is amazing. You know what every bird has done for the past X number of years. And I said, yeah, doesn't like most everyone know that other kind? He said, no, no, they don't. So he was able to get money from a, uh, from a uh, European bank that was funding something called Sensei, which is the Sentinels of Sea Ice. And we were, we were, we were part of that work. And we, uh, we, we, we were able to hire a population modeler, Pierre Lujan, who is, who is currently modeling the population um, and, and knows more about models than I would ever know. But again, I know more about black guillemots than he will ever know. And also working with Akito, Akiko Akedo and Karine Delord, who are at, uh, at, uh, at Shize and are working with us on a number of uh, analyses. So this was a major, uh, a major breakthrough for us to have, this, to have this happen. One of the things that was obvious to me for a long time, uh, and what this graph shows, are local birds. And local birds are birds that I banded as chicks that came back to breed. And immigrants are birds that came in and were unbanded which meant that they did not fledge from Cooper Island because every bird's been banded there since 1975, every chick that has, that it, that has fledged. So, um, so I always knew that immigration was important, but I never thought about it in the detail probably that I should have because I was more preoccupied with the puffins and the polar bears and the sculpin. But now Christophe and Pierre Lou uh, are doing some very nice population models, which we'll be publishing uh, shortly. And what what they're realizing is that there was a major source of immigrants someplace to, to like drive this. Uh, and that essentially all of the changes that have occurred in the, in the Cooper Island population in terms of the increase, which was due just to immigration, that the decrease was due to a lack of immigration, that local productivity on Cooper really didn't mean that much compared to what was happening at the source colony that was feeding us the birds. So just very recently in the past, probably six weeks, a publication that I have found uh, that, uh, that the Russians uh, have, have censused, Herald Island. Um, Herald Island is a large, uh, rocky, uh, it's, it's like, a, a, I think maybe like a thousand feet tall or so, um, uh, island in the, in, the east, in, the, in, the, in the western Beaufort Sea that I knew had, had good uh, guillemot numbers on it. I had gone by once on a vessel and seen very large numbers of guillemots. They came out with a uh, sample, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an estimate recently of 60 to 70,000 <laughs> black guillemots uh, breeding on Cooper Island, um, you know, roughly, what, 250 miles away from Cooper. And I mean, I was excited when we got to 200 pairs. And what this made me realize, what it made me think of, it would be as if somebody was coming from the east and wanted to study humans in the Puget Sound area. And basically found Redmond in 1950 when there were 5,000 people living there and said, oh, I'll study this population and then studied it in detail over the next X number of years. And then someone said, oh, by the way, have you heard about Seattle? <laughs> because it turns out that like there is this major population uh, source that is almost just over the horizon from Cooper. But it turns out that what we've been looking at on Cooper that all the changes that have been taking place with ice and sea surface temperature, also they've been taking place at Herald Island. And we've been able to study it in detail because of the access we've had. You cannot study, and I mean, again, I've tried this once or twice, you cannot study guillemots in detail at this sort of colony. Um, so, so, so we were able to basically really have Cooper Island be a, a sentinel of what was going on with, with, with the larger population. This came even more into focus when, the, uh, when some uh, Canadian uh, collaborators, uh, Cameron Eckert, uh, who has been looking at the, at the, uh, at the Gilmot populations, uh, or the Gilmots breeding on, uh, on an old mission building on Herschel Island in Canada, and they've been monitoring that for, for almost as long as Cooper, and I looked at his data, and they see the same arc of basically an increase up until 1990 or so, and then this decrease, which is just so reinforcing. Um, I've had, um, I had a number of <laughs> rejections of proposals, and they said, this is one species on one island, you know, we, we, 
we want to fund much, broad, much, much more broadly based questions than that. And now it's like, oh, but it looks like that what we've seen on Cooper um, is also happening at this, at this other colony quite some distance away in Canada and likely is happening on Herald Island also. So that, so, that, so that by doing the detailed work we've done on Cooper, we can probably say, and also, look, and, and also looking at the oceanographic conditions that have caused that on Cooper and that have caused it uh, and that, that are taking place elsewhere to see, uh, to see if, it, if the same things might be going on. It is clear that loss of sea ice um, is a major uh, factor um, in terms, of, which isn't surprising given the fact that it's a sea ice obligate. In 1981, all the major colonies in the, in the, in the Western Arctic uh, had sea ice rather close. In 2007, the ice was well offshore. So one would expect to see the same sorts of changes that we are seeing on Cooper at these other much larger colonies. So it appears the entire Western Arctic metapopulation of Mans Black Guillemot is experiencing a decline in numbers and productivity as we have seen on, 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 on Cooper Island. Um, we, we are hoping to be able to uh, get to some of these colonies to look at them, but it's very hard because of both the uh, people, people aren't censusing Herald Island on a regular basis uh, uh, anymore. So, okay, so we've basically figured out what's going on with them in the winter, uh, rather, rather in the, in the summer, but we really had no idea what was going on for the rest of the year. Uh, because of the fact that uh, they would just go into the Bering Sea. And I'd like to note that this picture is of a winter plumage black guillemots. They are white guillemots for, um, for uh, nine months of the year. But we've been able to uh, put recently geolocators on them. These are, these are, these are light sensitive uh, data loggers that also give you wet dry state and temperature. And by putting them on birds uh, at the end of the breeding season, we can then find out the sunrise and sunset time for every day over the nine month period they're not on Cooper. We can find their wet dry state to see when they're on the ice and when they aren't. Uh, and also, also we, can find out, uh, we can find out conductivity. So, so that was all great and it was very important. Um, we didn't think much was needed to be monitored during the winter because there had been no long-term trend in overwinter survival. Um, that was the one positive thing that had been going on uh, with our study is that basically Bering Sea Ice was essentially not changing much. And that was true until recently. And now Bering Sea Ice, now, now the wintering habitat is decreasing um, as you can see by this, by this, by this graph. This was brought up brought out uh, in a major way in, in the winter of 2017, 20, 20, 20, 2018, when the Bering Sea ice extent had an unprecedentedly low level. Um, and um, there, was, there was a major uh, session at the American Geophysical Union meeting about this. And what I was really taken with is that, um, I don't wanna say that physical scientists don't get as excited about their work as biologists do, but I never saw physical scientists get so kind of animated in talking about, oh my gosh, we didn't, we don't know what's causing this. We don't know if it's, 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 it's this is going to be the, this is going to be the future. Uh, and it was, it was nothing. It was nothing that the models had, had predicted. Um, this, this is what happened in, uh, in 2017, 2018. In February 2018, uh, the ice uh, was up in the Chukchi Sea, the ice edge, as compared to uh, to 2012 when it was down by the Pribilof Islands. And this is, this is all Guillemot habitat uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Bering Sea ice. Um, and what happened in, in, in that year, in 2017, 2018, is that Guillemots barely went, this is a, this is a longitudinal, or this is a latitudinal changes by month. Uh, they had always gone down into the Bering Sea as far, certainly as far as St. Matthew, uh, sometimes f as, as, as far as, uh, as, as the Pribilofs, in 2017-2018, they went back into they went back into the Chukchi Sea, which was um, which was really unexpected. Um, uh, this 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 compares the late April uh, distribution in 2012, uh, and it is a major rain shift. It is it is something again that that I didn't anticipate five years ago when I was giving one of these talks. What this was tied to also was the highest overwinter mortality that we'd seen. Um, that basically uh, it was like 75% survival versus the normal close to 90%. And we also had a situation where birds came back and didn't breed 
we had never had that before, but a substantial number of birds in the colony came back and they weren't able to even lay eggs, um, you know, indicating that the winter conditions had, had uh, not left them in, uh, in the physical shape that was needed to, to be able to reproduce the following summer. This was all um, very uh, upsetting, but given the fact that we, that we had those geolocators on the birds, we were able to show where they were. Uh, and again, one of the problems is that we only get the geolocators back from the survivors. Uh, we had a lot of geolocators not come back by birds that died, uh, died, died, died that year. So um, I've also been collaborating with Kyle Elliott, uh, who is an excellent, uh, again, just like Christoph Barbrod, uh, a, a like renaissance man when it comes to uh, seabirds. And um, um, we've been working now for about two or three years. We have a paper coming out that was just recently uh, accepted and it's now in press uh, on how uh, seasonal, uh, how reductions in seasonal ice and uh, increased sea surface temperature can change the prey and foraging behavior. And that includes that graph I showed, I showed earlier. Uh, and we're gonna be having um, graduate students work on a number of the data sets with Kyle. But one of the things that, we've, that we're focusing on with Kyle are the temperature depth recorders. These are units like, like the one you see here. Um, and this is a fish that happened, this is a bird that happens to be carrying a, 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 a wolf fish, uh, which is a rather uncommon species up there. But we, we are now able to see the time underwater, the dive depth, the number of dives per day, a wide range of dive characteristics for the birds that are dealing with a warming Arctic. And again, this, this is rather recent. This is like the last three or four weeks we started looking at this and realized there's a rather direct correlation. I mean, uh, I mean, almost uh, hard to believe with sea surface temperature and the amount of time birds spend underwater when they are provisioning young. So that, so that, so that the birds that are able to raise young, the adults are working much harder now than they did when sea surface temperatures were lower. Um, I'm also uh, collaborating with Queen's University, uh, uh, Vicki Friesen, who has been doing genetics work. She's the person who found out about the bottleneck during the last glacial maximum and found that out uh, almost 20 years ago. Now she's doing more work on it. But Drew Save, who's been out on Cooper Island um, a number of times, was collecting blood samples and did a study recently on heritability versus plasticity in terms of, of the timing of egg laying. We have six generations uh, and now probably seven generations of individuals. So one can look at the characteristics of essentially any, 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 any characteristic and see if it might be inherited. And this was the thing about the timing of egg laying, like are birds uh, changing their timing of, heg, of, 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 of egg laying because of the plasticity or are, has there been selection for earlier breeders? Uh, what he found out is that basically it's being plastic, but he sent us into functional ecology. I got a call um, uh, or I got an email from uh, Drew saying, do you have a good picture of uh, guillemots? They want to put this on the cover. And this is a master's student. Um, and, um, and, I mean, and what was really nice is that the editor wrote a spotlight piece saying that having, having six generations that you can follow and um, make these statements and have it being, having it be a, a, a wild population that is responding to climate change is truly amazing and this is an important piece. So, so, so that collaboration um, has, been, has been one that, that has been very, 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 very satisfying. So this, this, this gets us into 2020. Uh, it, was, it was a strange year for everyone. Um, um, and I, like all of you, was just happy to get through March and April. And then I would usually, uh, in May, be getting ready to go to the field. And the National Science Foundation and many other groups were canceling their Arctic uh, field work. Um, there were issues in terms of both in terms of field camps uh, in COVID-19, but certainly in going to, um, uh, to uh, uh, small towns and villages where indigenous populations uh, who hadn't been exposed at that point to any COVID-19 might be exposed. So, so I was basically, I had come to, and you can imagine after 45, 46 years, it was not easy, but again, it changes your priorities. Uh, I, mean, I mean, in terms of you think, okay, um, um, yes, I, I've, I've done this study, but this year I'm not gonna do it. I didn't know how I could fill in for the lost year in terms of the individual histories, but it was, it was, it was not as important as, 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 as getting through 
getting through the spring. And then um, I get a call from Utkiavik, uh, Alaska, uh, out of the blue, and it just to totally <laughs> made my day. Uh, Robert Sudam said, hey, when are you coming up? And, 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 and I, I had thought that they had probably been on lockdown uh, in terms of not letting anyone in. And it turns out that um, April Brooks, who's in charge of search and rescue, who is used to scheduling a helicopter flight for me to get out to Cooper, was thinking, gee, George hasn't come up yet, um, which meant everything to me. Um, um, as I said, Utkiavik is a, uh, is, is a, uh, it's a town of around 4,000 people, mainly uh, Inuit, uh, Inupiat, who still, to a great extent, um, get by on subsistence. Uh, and they have a major subsistence harvest of bowhead whales, caribou, and various things like that, which is why they have, why they have in their North Slope Borough, which is like a county government, a very good wildlife uh, management department that essentially is there to make sure that their residents uh, can't be pushed around by state and federal regulations that don't take the locals into account. Um, and I've gotten to be, uh, they've been a major force in keeping the Cooper Island study. And these, and these three people, April Brooks, uh, Craig George, and Takla Kipa, uh, April is the uh, head of search and rescue currently, Craig is a bowhead biologist, long-term friend, Takla is the head of wildlife management. I should mention that April Brooks will frequently mention that she was in, I believe, elementary school when I gave a talk to her class about the Black Guillemots. And this, this shows one of the reasons it's good to do a long-term study at a place like that. She has a, a direct connection from hearing about this study when she was in elementary school and now being the person who can schedule helicopters to take me out there to keep it going. Um, there are other people. Robert Sudam uh, was out on Cooper in 88. Leslie Pierce got me a fast uh, COVID-19, uh, a, 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 a rapid uh, check uh, so I could, I could get out. I only had a quarantine for six hours until the rapid test came back. Benny Nagyak has been a long-term supporter um, uh, uh, over time. And Billy Adams, um, who is... Uh, who has saved my life a number of times um, and, has, uh, and, and is also a very good friend and one of the funniest people I know. He, uh, he has, uh, over the years, provided a great deal of support. It is good to have friends like him who go out to the ice on, uh, on a regular basis to, to hunt seals, to look around. And now, because he knows I'm interested in guillemots, he takes pictures of guillemots in the winter. And this was from February 2016, and he sends me these things. So it is so good to be able to have that sort of connection with the people who live in town uh, and have them say, oh, by the way, your work is important to us. We're going to both support you and also send you things like pictures of, 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 of wintering guillemots. Um, so I was tested in uh, Seattle. I came. Uh, I, I I had a negative test in mid July, uh, almost almost a month later than normal. Uh, I was taken out by uh, Bear, uh, by Northern Bureau Search Search and Rescue, uh, that has played a major role. They picked me up off the island in 2002 when the polar bears had wrecked our camp, and I, and I got to. Um, Cooper, and it was a very strange year. This is, not a, this is not a scene from this year, just to show you the difference. Usually I get fresh water now from the snow that has uh, drifted around my camp, and then I, I put these into uh, garbage pails and things like that, and I basically drink melted snow for much of the summer. Uh, I got there too late for this this year, so I had to take out lots of water. It was also tough because um, uh, it, it was very strange to go from a high anxiety uh, uh, episode of flying and wearing, wearing the mask to getting out there, realizing I could take off the mask, but then picking up the shotgun and realizing that there are existential threats that you need to deal with with, with both masks and, 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 and with shotguns. And I realized that dealing with a polar bear was a much more straightforward way uh, and a th thing to deal with in terms of, in ter in terms of threats. Um, one of the major problems that occurred is that Catherine Smith, who's been able to join me out there since the early 2000s, wasn't able to come out. So I spent a lot of time alone on the island, uh, which was, to be honest, a very tough time. It was, it was tough because of the, what was going on with the birds. It was tough because of whatever stress levels we all had in the spring. I still had the high court levels, and I got out there, and everything that was happening seemed to, seemed to uh, be much more dire than things had been in the past. So what I found is that, is that the colony is continuing to decrease. Um, uh, it is... It is, it is uh, 
It is tracking the, uh, the, the, the sea ice minimum uh, very well, and that we had a record low number of breeders, at least, at least for, the, for, the, for, the, for the recent past this year. Um, there were uh, 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 many, many birds didn't come back. Overwinter uh, survival was low. Mortality was close to 25%, which is twice the long-term average. Only 36 pairs laid eggs, down from 80 in 2019. One third of the returning pairs didn't lay eggs. Half of the pairs with eggs didn't incubate. And uh, uh, there were only chicks present in 11 nests. Now, the only real positive thing uh, that, that I, can, I can say about this past summer is that because we have everyone banded on the island, we know their breeding history. And by looking at the experience of, of, of birds that didn't lay eggs, uh, that laid eggs and didn't incubate them, and that ones that did, it was the birds that had a good amount of experience, including one that was basically two decades old, that had essentially been through it. I mean, they had, they had been through a lot over the past 20 years of climate change, and they were able to incubate eggs and, and, and hatch them and actually do very well in terms of, in terms of the growth rates. So this is showing that, yes, uh, this, is, this, this might be the bottleneck where you, where, where you have some of the older birds that are able to cope with the change going on. So, um, I, uh, uh, um, I am used to talking to myself on the island um, um, and, uh, because I'm out there alone so much. And it was very nice to have the unexpected voice of a vessel going by, the Terra, Terra, Terra Nova, that was uh, leaving from Seattle, as it turns out, or from Puget Sound, came by Cooper and called me in the middle of the night. And it was, it was just great to chat with somebody. Uh, they unfortunately only got down to, uh, um, to the, to the uh, Eastern Beaufort and then realized they couldn't get into, into, into Canada. Um, but they were even nice enough because I was very much wanting to break camp because I was really having a tough time coping with the, uh, with the uh, solitary confinement on the island. And they even offered to come in and see if they could send a dinghy in so that, so that, so that I, could, uh, I could leave the island. It turns out I have too much gear for doing that. And, and I, just, I just want to thank the people. They will be hopefully going by in a year or two, actually not this coming summer, but in the next summer, and going by Cooper. And I look forward to celebrating their Northwest Passage. Uh, the other thing is that, and, and uh, I listen to KBRW uh, uh, a great deal. In, uh, in the in the in the summer, it's a it is it, it is a human voice. Um, I, I've been out there without a radio, and it isn't good to not hear a human voice for weeks on end. So so I I am a big fan of KBRW AM and FM, and have gotten to be good friends with a number of the broadcasters because it's the only voice I hear. And one of the things that happened in spring of last year, it was basically the first week in February, is that there were there were there was a uh, there were conversations on seabird listservs about the fact that this is Black Lives Matter week, and uh, and essentially, is there any way in which seabird research relates to that, or what can we do, or how can we increase the diversity of this? And this is a 2020 issue that that I thought was worth mentioning. Um, so I uh, I basically. Uh, uh, Posted something to this to this to this listserv that had been an issue for me in 1969 when I was going to uh, lead inner city youth on bird watching tours on the East Coast, and I looked at some of the field marks and I realized, wait a minute, these are all flesh colored. These this all refers to Caucasian flesh, um, and and that you could not take a, a mixed race group out and use use the term flesh without being very uh, inappropriate. And I actually wrote the, I wrote in 1969, uh, Roger Troy Peterson and said, you know, have you thought about maybe changing your field guides? He said he didn't think it was an issue. But I just, I, I just brought this up on this, on this, on this listserv and people embraced it and said, and then I, at the, at the end of my talk, I said, by the way, you know that the flesh-footed shearwater is a species we talk about. It's a rather abundant southern hemisphere uh, species. We talk about it all the time. And I just realized that it clearly um, shouldn't be called a flesh-footed shearwater. I happened to, because I listened to Away With Words a lot, uh, contact uh, Martha Barnett and tell her that I thought this would be something that, that, that would be worth uh, talking about. And she, and she responded you know, immediately and said, yes, come on the air. And so I did, before going out in the field, do an interview with her about the fact that there was this term that was an ornithological term that was, uh, that, that, 
that showed a major racial bias. Um, what I what was the what, what what the big surprise was was that was that I came back to, to the cabin after weighing the chicks, turned on the radio, and not having heard many voices at all except people on the radio, had Martha saying, "And now here's George from Seattle." And then I heard myself on KBR on KBRW talking about this about this about this issue. Um, by the way, there have been uh, two petitions started to change the name from flesh-footed shearwater to pale-footed shearwater. Um, and people are going onto their websites, I've seen, and changing their field marks if they can easily to, because flesh is used frequently to describe a pinkish beige uh, soft part color. So, um, presidential politics. We all thought about presidential politics a great deal in the past year. Um, I, I just want to say that Richard Nixon was the reason I was out on Cooper because of the fact that he started the EPA and somebody had to write uh, environmental impact statements and because of the Arab oil embargo and he said we need to drill offshore. So Richard Nixon was the reason I was out there uh, in 1972 and the reason I went back in 75. Uh, Ronald Reagan played a role in this because when people say what is the reason the colony stopped growing in the early 80s uh, and I go it was Ronald Reagan because essentially I didn't have a field season once Ronald Reagan came into office and I was out there alone. I couldn't handle more than 200 nests or so, so I stopped building nest sites. If Ronald Reagan hadn't been elected, uh, the colony could have gone up to 300 pairs or so. Um, uh, Bill Clinton's main contribution to the Cooper Island study was that he had Al Gore as the vice president, and Al Gore obviously brought the issue of climate change to a much larger audience. Um, and as I thought about it, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the only reason these boxes are out there is because Dwight D. Eisenhower ended the Korean War and uh, a bunch of people in the Navy dropped boxes there in the mid-50s. So that, so, that, so that Dwight D. Eisenhower actually started the Cooper Island colony. Uh, but most importantly, um, now, we have, now we have Joe Biden. And um, uh, in early 72, uh, I was turning over nest sites to create uh, Gillimont nest sites. Joe was shaking hands. Um, neither of us knew half a century later that Joe would end up in the White House because of all the good uh, handshaking and politicking he had done, or that I would end up in the Cooper Island cabin because of having checked nest sites for, for the last uh, five decades. But uh, this has had an impact on our Coop Brown work. Uh, there is a climate change indicators volume that, that, the, that the EPA puts out annually. I had been contacted during the last four years, if you will, about having a section on it, but the person said, we aren't really publishing this because of the administration not wanting to mention climate change, but could you please you know, provide information? So, so I did, and we wrote up this rather nice thing, and I was very happy that essentially, yes, this will go into an EPA volume on climate change indicators. Um, um, I mean, clearly, when you spend as much time as I have trying to study a colony, and then you think that the EPA is going to use it as an indicator, uh, it's very helpful. It was very disconcerting that this was never uh, published uh, during, the, during the last four years. And in late January, uh, shortly after the inauguration, I get a call from the person who's doing this, or I get an email, saying, could you please update this? We're going to start publishing this again. So, like, Joe Biden coming in certainly changed that uh, distribution of Cooper Island data. He also uh, reinstated this uh, Bering Sea resilience area, which uh, Barack Obama had uh, started, that basically uh, protects the wintering grounds. So, um, this is to show you just uh, an episode of what happened on the island um, just before I left. I'm going to sleep and, um, and just checking out to see if there are any birds around. I wanted you to get a feel of what it's like. This is a bear showing up uh, shortly after, after I had gone to sleep, um, walking by the front of the cabin. Um, this, this is a different camera. He shows up and starts poking around. Because it was a, a temporary field camp, I didn't set up the, the bear fence, the electric fence, as well as I should have. You can see it's not great. And as a result, the bear found a place on the far side of the cabin where it could get in to, it could get into the yard. Uh, it then sniffs around into uh, a, a barrel that doesn't have anything into it, and then sniffs whatever I had cooked for dinner that night that's coming through that seam. And then, in something that's too quick to even to have this camera record, jumps up and tries to push in the door. And I, I was sleeping, heard this pounding, 
I then open the door and the bear, the bear, the bear backs away. Um, this sort of thing happening uh, at, at a time when, when so much else is going on in the world. Um, uh, in the past, I could somehow roll with the punches when polar bears showed up. This was a major stressor for me. Um, I felt much more vulnerable. And I think it was because um, in 2020, we all felt much more vulnerable no matter what the situation was. It didn't have to be a polar bear at the door to make you feel vulnerable in 2020. So um, just for some outreach and final thoughts, um, uh, we, were, we, we were very lucky to have Maria Coriel, I'm sorry, that should have been labeled, Maria Coriel and Katie uh, Morrison uh, come out to the island in 2019. Maria has some excellent uh, uh, watercolors that we had hoped to show at Town Hall last year, um, but, um, but that was canceled because of COVID-19. Uh, you can go to her, uh, uh, you can go to her website, which will be linked from my, from my website. Um, Gretel Ehrlich, um, who many of you know uh, for, from her writings, I have a copy of The Future of Ice um, in the Cooper Island Library. And Gretel and I have gotten to be friends um, uh, over time. I gave her some information on Arctic Turrence for a book she was writing. And she's, uh, and she's best known, perhaps, for the Souls of Open Spaces, about how dealing with grief and going out into nature um, can um, going out to nature can help you deal with that grief. She just published in the past month or so, Unsolaced, and the last chapter in the book has to uh, deal with her visit to Cooper Island in 2019. If you are interested in Gretel's uh, work, I certainly urge you to read it. I mean, certainly the whole book is certainly well uh, written and, and, and informative. She gives a very good account of what it feels like to be on Cooper. Um, it isn't just the data points. It's, it's what it's like to see what's going on. Um, so having said all that, I'd like to thank all of our donors and supporters. Um, there are many of you, um, uh, Tom and Sonia Campion, the Boylston's, Martin Faber, Martin Kenley, and Bill Cummings, Johnson uh, and Heffling Family Foundation. Um, and, and I can't thank the, the people who, who donate, um, you know, anything at all and, and basically indicate to me that yes, I feel, I feel that what you're doing is important. So many people first got to know of me because of this image that was on the New York Times cover in, in, uh, in, 20, uh, in, 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 in 2002. It was a picture uh, taken by Joe McNally to accompany Darcy Frey's piece on his Cooper Island visit uh, of 2001. Joe and I have stayed friends um, ever since he was out on Cooper for around two weeks in 2001. I've often said, if you come out, Joe, uh, and I try to stand at the same spot where you took that picture, uh, it's going to be very different. Joe, in case you don't know, is an incredibly famous photographer, and he's also, I mean, and he's famous because he's so good. I am the least famous and least attractive person uh, he's ever he's ever he's ever photographed. Um, but because we've stayed in touch, he got Nikon to pay for. Uh, uh, his visit in 2019, a return visit, 18 years later, uh, and come out and visit me, and brought a video crew with him. And I'm going to show you our attempt, uh, and it was a successful attempt, to retake the shot that was on the cover of the of the of the of the New York Times Magazine. This is a clip from a longer 14-minute video, which is available online that that has much more background about about the about the about his visit. This exact spot used to be ice 18 years ago. This isn't a computer module or an algorithm or a prediction. This is real life. George has seen it and experienced it. He's worthy of a photograph, and I'm proud to take it. <laughs> so, what do you think? That's it. That's the picture. You got it. Um, yeah, um, I mean, you might have seen that Joe's boots were taking in water. He, he was in water that Arctic Cod might even be comfortable in. But he is a great photographer, and, and the fact that he came out and was willing to take that, take that time to take this picture. Both these shots were taken at roughly 2.30 in the morning at solar, at solar midnight, uh, uh, Cooper Island, and um, at Giavik time. So, um, yeah, I... Uh, 
have more to say, but I always do, and maybe we would like to have Katie pass some questions on if there were any questions that you would like to pass on. Great, thank you so much, Georgia. We have several questions um, for you. Uh, the first one is someone wondering, are any nest cases being built for other birds in any other parts of Alaska or Canada? Are, 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 are nest sites being built? Well, are nest cases being used in any other studies for birds across Alaska or Canada? Well, I mean, actually, I mean, I mean, in terms of studying birds in detail, there's a very interesting study on Middleton Island where kittiwake ledges are being built inside of what is essentially a silo that researchers can go in. Um, and they are building that. And again, this is a great way of, 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 of being able to study a species, but as soon as you do it, you are changing the dynamics a bit. So then you have to realize that, okay, I can study growth rates, I can study the prey they're bringing in, but the actual population, it's just like when I put the plastic cases out there, that changed the whole uh, track of what was going on on Cooper. Uh, because of the fact that if the polar bears and puffins had their way, they would have, they would have wiped out the colony. Great. Um, thinking about the range of black guillemots, would you ever get to see one in the lower 48? Um, you can see black guillemots. You can see a different subspecies of black guillemots in Maine, certainly. Um, um, pigeon guillemots are found on the, a very close relative, uh, is found from the Bering Strait down to, uh, down to California. And they breed pigeon guillemots, which look very, very similar, uh, breed under the Edgewater Hotel. Um, they breed out at the, at the Port Townsend Marine Science Center under the dock. Um, but n um, but, but y you would have to go to Maine to see them, to see them breeding. Great. Um, in your opinion, should black guillemots be considered threatened, considering the impact that the retreating ice and pressures of predators are having on them? Yeah, that's that, that's a that's a that's an important question. Um, uh, the 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 work at Queen's University has shown that compared to the other black guillemot populations they've sampled, and they've sampled a lot of um, uh, populations throughout the species range, that the Cooper Island population, which would also be the one over on Harold Island, is um, unique. And that certainly in terms of management would require its own management plans. One of the problems with this is that there's no way you can really manage, uh, manage them, so there's not much you can do. Um, it certainly looks like, from what we're seeing, that Mance Black Guillemot um, is going to greatly decline. And a rather important point to make, and it's something I've only come to the real realization um, in terms of what this means to the colony, uh, is that Guillemots can breed as solitary pairs. They're, they are not a highly colonial seabird that has to have 1,000 uh, members of its own species close by to breed successfully. Cooper Island could get down to five pairs. They could breed on, they could find fish close by if they can get through the winter and not deal with the, with the, with the, with the ice situation. They could, they could persist. So, so probably the large uh, trends we've seen in the, uh, in, the, in the population in terms of the decrease tell you a great deal about what's going on with the cryopelagic system. That's important, but it's very doubtful that the species would ever become extinct as such because they could always almost certainly get by as a few individual pairs. Um, uh, another question is, one of the most endearing aspects we've connected with over the decades has been the singular tales of genealogy of the black guillemots. Um, could you relate one of your many vignettes about the offspring of a generation X, Y, Z? I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't quite. One oh. of the um, just uh, the question is, just could you tell um, one of the stories of sort of a, uh, a like a generation of, of guillemots, sort of that um, sort of the offspring well, genealogy? Sort of, well, I mean, and that's something that I, uh, I mean, and I could give, I mean, because we have these generations, I mean, we, we had, uh, I don't know if you saw uh, Hannah, H Hannah Waters wrote an excellent piece on um, on, uh, on, on the Cooper Island uh, colony as a cover story on Audubon magazine, it turns out the bird she had on the cover was this incredibly interesting female who had had, um, oh, I don't know how many young come back and had X number of grand children as such on the island. And again, when I'm on the island and I'm, I mean, and, and just looking at the data sets and, and, and dealing, I mean, people say, isn't it really lonely out there? Well, no, I mean, if I can look back and look at how uh, deep some of this goes and relate to years. I mean, 
even the picture that was, the, uh, that, that was on the announcement for this talk, that was a picture Joe took in, uh, in uh, 2001. And that bird lived for the next 19 years. On, I mean, basically shared the island with me for the next uh, 19 years. So that sort of connection. And again, you know, uh, that isn't what people uh, want in scientific literature. But I mean, and, and Katie and I have talked about the fact that certainly children's books and, and just basically a general narrative of like understanding about what it's like to have been through, as many of these birds now have been through, such major climate change issues. Great. Um, what are the human impacts you've noticed from climate change on the local indigenous people? Um, well, there have been, uh, there have been, I mean, most of them are due to, uh, uh, due to the pack ice melt or to, or to, or to ice melt. There were some, uh, there were some very unfortunate, uh, uh, things happening with people breaking through, uh, ice on tundra ponds. Uh, and drowning, uh, ice that in the past probably was able to sustain them. Um, uh, two years ago, bowhead whales didn't come in um, until the very end of the season uh, because they were apparently avoiding, uh, avoiding the near shore close to Utkiavik. And my friend Craig George thought it might be due to the fact that killer whales are moving north um, and they had not been there in the past. Uh, there are major erosion problems that are occurring. Both, I mean, and Cooper has a, a major erosion problem. Cooper used to be uh, permafrost, and the permafrost has melted, so now it's rapidly eroding. Um, um, certainly, the uh, shoreline at Utkiavik is having the same things, and it is a double whammy as the ice pulls offshore, the waves get bigger. Uh, so then you have more uh, wave erosion, as well as just the fact that the, that the sediment at the shoreline is much more easily eroded. Great. Um, could you talk about the emotional aspect of knowing your study birds as individuals, siblings, parents, and even great-great-grandparents? It's such intimate knowledge and beautiful to know them so well while you study them in the breeding season. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, one of the longest live birds early on was white, orange, gray. We, we, we put three color, band, or three, three color bands on the bird, and this bird happened to be white, orange, and gray, which you could actually pronounce as wogey in terms of our shorthand. So like wogey was one of our favorite birds and had many, uh, she, she, she like outlived uh, many of her mates. She had, she like produced many young. And I realized that I was gonna have a tough time uh, when, when there was a start of a breeding season and I went to her nest site and she wasn't there. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, it isn't quite the same as losing a pet, but if you have been, and also, I mean, as, as I would mention, like white orange gray for that period of my life was sometimes the only warm blooded vertebrate I saw annually because I didn't see my family uh, every year, uh, various things like that. So like she, she was the constant in my life for quite some time and then, um, and then she was gone. But I mean, again, it's, but then what's so nice is that you then have their offspring, uh, which is why the information on the, on, the, on the lineages are just so surprising. And again, it was one of these things where um, I, this happens on a regular basis now. People say, I can't believe you have all the data. And I thought, well, if you go out to a colony and gather data, this is what you get. And I don't know why more people, I really don't know why more people haven't, haven't, haven't done that. They, they like certainly do it over in Great Britain and other areas where seabird research isn't so driven by resource extraction. Uh, certainly in the States, things tend to be uh, oriented towards oil, either oil extraction or fisheries development. How do you stay optimistic given everything you've seen? I, uh, I was, uh, uh, quite some time ago, I was on a climate change panel and somebody went down the row of people saying, what, uh, what, what, um, uh, why, why, why do you stay optimistic? And the short answer, because I'm a big believer in natural selection, even in human traits, is that because there's been selection for optimism in the past, and I am basically the offspring of people who are optimistic. And I mean, and I mean, and I know that's a somewhat flippant thing, but it is true that anyone who ever gave up probably didn't have as high a gene frequency in the next generation as somebody who was, who, who was optimistic no matter what. I, um, uh, uh, I mean, 
it isn't clear what's going to happen next and now when people are saying that, you know, uh, maybe if, 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 if we can uh, do something to really cut down fossil fuel emissions, things aren't going to be as bad as we hope in the future. I'm certainly willing to give that, and, and whatever chance that would be, whatever it be, 5 or 10 percent, you basically, have to, you basically have, to, have to hope for that. It is tough to see all these chicks dying in the nest site and, and thinking, thinking about the fact that, uh, that, yes, these chicks used to be, we used to have 150 nests producing, you know, over 200 chicks. Now we have 11 nests producing far fewer, and, um, and I mean, it just helps to stay philosophical, and uh, I mean, to a certain extent, I'm just, I mean, I can't, I can't, you know, believe I was able to witness what I witnessed. I mean, I mean, I take, I take solace in that, and also I realize I can't stop now. I can't stop now, which is a tough thing because it doesn't take uh, much time to check 11 nests per day. It isn't like 150 nests per day where you have to stay constantly active. But I can't abandon the colony now because we are looking at possibly documenting on an individual basis this major decrease in a, in a, in a, in a species that is unprecedented. One last question, George. How long do you think you'll continue the study? <laughs> okay, so I, uh, somebody, uh, Francis McHugh asked me this recently, uh, like, are, are, you, are you going back next summer? Um, when you go to the 47th uh, wedding anniversary of a couple, uh, you don't usually go up to them and say, do you two plan to start dating next year? You know, I mean, I mean, maybe they're committed to each other, and maybe it's, and, and also you don't say, you don't say, gee, I can't believe how dedicated the two of you are. Maybe they actually liked each other for 47 years, and it wasn't just a chore to do that. Um, I will keep going, and one of the really nice things about having collaborators and people who are one third my age working on the, uh, on the, on the project is that they are getting a vested uh, interest in it in that they, they, they like realize if they can go out to a colony and write papers about a 47 year database with, with seven generations going on, it can, it can help them in terms of their career and it will keep going. So I will uh, keep going out there uh, as long as, um, as a North Slope Borough uh, lets me uh, go out there, and most importantly, as long as Catherine Smith and Carl Ian DeVoki let me. Okay. That's all the questions. Great, thanks. Well, uh, this has been uh, an interesting, uh, uh, I was looking on this as the impossible uh, Seattle update after the impossible field season, but, but I've actually, I, I like hope that you uh, got something from this, and certainly feel free to, to, uh, to uh, email me uh, if you have other questions. Uh, I wanna thank all you for attending the virtual event and express our gratitude to our donors uh, and supporters who've made our long-term study possible. Uh, we are anticipating having a normal field season this coming uh, summer and look forward to telling you about it on our blog and hopefully at an in-person event in early 2022. Um, and we are looking at ways to stream our future annual events so that our, um, so that our reach in terms of geography uh, can be more than just the Puget Sound area. But uh, thank you very much for your time and attention.